Be gracious to me, O God, according to your mercy. Erase my acts of rebellion according to the greatness of your compassion. Scrub me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin, for I admit my rebellious acts. My sin is always in front of me. Against you, you only have I sinned. And I have done what is evil in your eyes, so you are justified when you sentence me. You are blameless when you judge. Certainly, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. Since you desire truth on the inside, in my hidden heart you teach me wisdom. Remove my sin with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have crushed celebrate. Hide your face from my sins. Erase all my guilty deeds. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew an unwavering spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Sustain me with a willing spirit. I will teach rebels your ways, and sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from bloodshed, O God, the God who saves me. My tongue will shout for joy about your righteousness. Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you do not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices God wants are a broken spirit, a broken and crushed heart, O God, you will not despise. As it pleases you, do good for Zion. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will be pleased with righteous sacrifices, burnt offerings, and whole offerings. Then bulls will be offered up on your altar. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, God created us to know joy in fellowship with Him, to love all people and to live in harmony with all creation. But sin separates us from God, our neighbors, and creation. And so we do not enjoy the life our Creator intended for us. By our sin, we grieve our Father, who does not desire that any come under his judgment, but to turn to him and live. Therefore, God in his mercy has sent our Lord Jesus Christ to take our place under the law, to suffer for us, and to die the death we deserve. God made Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. During the forty days of Lent, we fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. The time of Lent reminds us that to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, we must also know the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. As disciples of our Lord Jesus, we are called to struggle against everything that leads us away from love of God and neighbor. Let us confess our sins, ask our Father for forgiveness, and commit ourselves to this struggle. Most holy and merciful Father, we confess to you and to one another that we have sinned by our own fault, by our own grievous fault in thought, word and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. We have been deaf to your call to serve as Christ served us. We have not been true to the mind of Christ. We have grieved the Holy Spirit. 
We have placed our wants before your will. We have gratified the desires of our sinful nature. We have merited your punishment now and forever. We confess to you, Lord, all our past unfaithfulness, the pride, hypocrisy, and impatience of our lives. Our self-indulgent appetites and ways, our manipulation of other people, and our anger when our selfish aims are denied and our envy of those more fortunate than ourselves. We confess to you, Lord. Our love for worldly goods and comforts, and our dishonesty in our daily life and work, our negligence in worship and prayer, and our failure to show the faith that is in us. We confess to you, Lord. Forgive us, Lord, for the wrongs we have done, for our blindness to human need and suffering, and our indifference to injustice and cruelty. Forgive us, Lord. For all false judgments, for uncharitable thoughts towards others, and for our prejudice and contempt for those who differ from us. Forgive us, Lord. For what we think or say or do that is in variance with your will. Restore us, good Lord, and let your anger depart from us. Those who wish to receive the ashes may come forward. If you do not want to receive them on your forehead, you can hold out your hand like this and they will be put there. Remember that you are dust, to dust you shall return. Accomplish in us, Lord, the work of your salvation. That we may show forth your glory in the world. By the cross and suffering of your Son. Bring us with all your saints to the joy of his resurrection. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, does not desire the death of sinners, but rather that they turn from their wickedness and live. He sent his Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins and for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. During these days of Lent, let us implore God to give us renewal and his Holy Spirit. May we continue to abide in the true faith and at last be received by him through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please rise. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, 
You never despise what you have made and always forgive those who turn to you. Create in us such new and contrite hearts that we may truly repent of our sins and obtain your full and gracious pardon. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. first lesson for our consideration this evening is written for us in Joel chapter 2. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing, grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. Lo, the trumpet in Zion. Declare a holy fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather the people. Consecrate the assembly. Bring together the elders. Gather the children, those nursing at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Let the priests who minister before the Lord weep between the portico and the altar. Let them say, Spare your people, Lord. Do not make your inheritance an object of scorn, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, Where is their God? Then the Lord was jealous for his land and took pity on his people. The Lord replied to them, I am sending you grain, new wine, and oil, enough to satisfy you fully. Never again will I make you an object of scorn to the nations. The word of the Lord. Our second lesson from 1 John 1, verses 5 through 9. This is the message we heard from him and proclaimed to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him but still walk in the darkness, we are lying and do not put the truth into practice. But if we walk in the light, just as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The word of the Lord. Be Please rise. <laughs> Matthew chapter 6. Whenever you fast, do not make yourself look sad like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces to show everyone that they are fasting. Amen, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that it is not apparent to the people that you are fasting 
but only to your Father who sees what is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Do not store up treasures for yourselves on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up treasures for yourselves in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. Because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated as we join in singing our hymn of the day, hymn 650, From Depths of Woe, O Lord God, I Cry.
By your mercies, O God, we are not consumed. For your compassions are new every morning. Here again, words written for us in Matthew chapter 6. Do not store up treasures for yourselves on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up treasures for yourselves in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. Because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You may be seated. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, So, the doctor asked, How are you feeling? Well, you know, the same as always, I guess. I've been a little tired, maybe, a li lately. But then he quickly interjected, but I've been busy at work, so I'm not too worried about it. But as the doctor looked at him and saw how he was sitting there and how he looked and the look in his eyes and the way he was talking and the little hint of uncertainty in his voice, he began to worry himself. And so he said, well, before we start your exam today, I'm going to order you just a few tests. Unless our bodies are under attack from bacteria or invaded by some virus or perhaps afflicted by some accidental injury, people aren't very good at noticing changes in their health. How do you compare your energy today to yesterday or even more to two years ago? What we don't check our pulses very often, and so we don't know if our hearts are beating faster or working harder than they were some time ago. At least our pants will alert us if we begin to put on a few of those extra pounds. But your internal organs don't have anything like that to tell us what, that they aren't what they once were. That's, of course, why we go to checkups in the first place. This is why the doctors run tests. Checking our health periodically is far better than learning something is wrong when something goes wrong. Spiritually, in our life of faith, it can be even harder to tell how healthy we are, especially when there is little or no pressure in the outside world to make us uncomfortable when we get spiritually out of shape, we don't notice when our faith begins to weaken or even when it's struggling to hold on. It's very easy for us to begin to think, well, I go to church, I read my Bible, or maybe even better, I, I know my Bible better than most people do, I'm a good person. Certainly I'm not committing those sins like they do out there, so I must be all right. Well, today Jesus calls us in for our exam. He's going to take a good look at us, at our hearts, and the health of our faith. This, today, and really throughout the entire season of Lent, is your heart's yearly checkup. We, in America, we Lutherans, even, even we who have memorized Luther's small catechism, even if that was some time ago, we probably wouldn't put fasting up there on religious activities which are of value to us. Certainly we wouldn't put them along our giving and along our prayers like Jesus happens to do here in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus attaches the same warning to fasting as he does to both giving and to prayer. He says, whenever you fast, do not be like the hypocrites. They disfigure their faces so that everyone knows they are fasting. When we hear the word hypocrite, we think of someone who says one thing but does another. But that's not quite 
what the Greek word means, and it's not quite what Jesus is talking about. When Jesus describes the hypocrites, they are doing exactly what they say people should be doing. But they're not doing it for the right purposes. It's all a show to them. And so they help out the poor, not to help those who are in need, but so that others will see them and praise them. And so they can pat themselves on the back at how righteous they are. When they pray, they're not having an intimate conversation with their Lord and Creator, their Father in heaven, but rather it's because that's what religious people are supposed to do. They don't fast to humble themselves and to discipline their bodies but it is all a show. It's like an actor donning a mask or wearing makeup to hide what's really going on underneath. We can easily understand how Jesus might describe those who fast as hypocrites. It would be quite easy to be putting on a show. Oh, I'm so hungry. You know, I didn't even have the energy. I couldn't... I couldn't shave today or put myself together. Oh, that chocolate looks so good, but I can't. I simply can't. After all, what's the point of sacrificing like that if no one really appreciates how much you are suffering? And so we might ask, if we can see the problem with fasting, and Jesus points it out, is there any benefit? Well, Jesus rebukes those who would fast in a hypocritical way, but at the same time, he attaches a promise to those who fast with a sincere heart. He says, Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. But God only ordered his people to fast one time a year. And that was to prepare them for the great day of atonement. In our Old Testament lesson, we heard Joel say, Consecrate a holy fast. Ring the trumpets. Let everyone fast and mourn. It was a way to mourn over their sins and to intensify their cries to the Lord. Have mercy on us. And yet, by the time Jesus came into Israel, the Pharisees were used to fasting twice a week and they didn't necessarily have repentance on their mind so what is the purpose of that suffering certainly god can't be impressed if we avoid stuffing our faces for a few hours or even for a few days he isn't impressed that you can go without sweets that a previous generation would have never been able to eat in the first place He's not impressed that people can give up looking at screens or whatever fast a person might imagine to keep throughout the season of Lent. Fasting never impresses God. Fasting doesn't make you holier in his sight. Fasting doesn't make God more eager to hear your prayers. It doesn't get his attention. And so we might ask Jesus, well, what's the point? What then is the reward? Well, when the cardiologist is really getting serious about checking your heart, she needs to do more than simply look at the test results and listen to your heart through a stethoscope. She can only learn so much while you're sitting there on the exam table Instead, she needs to get your heart working. You walk on a treadmill or maybe if you have to start running on the treadmill to get your heart rate up, to get it stressed out a little bit. All the while, the doctors and the nurses are watching what is going on. They're monitoring all of those electrical signals because they figure it's better to find the problem there in the lab than out there when you're hiking in the wilderness. Our faith as Christians in America today has likely never needed a stress test more. Just like 
our lives have become more sedentary as we sit in offices and relax on couches to watch TV. So also our faith often becomes quite sedentary. It rarely gets pumping. It faces little adversity. And when life is good, when we have our health, when we have security, when nothing is stressing our faith, well then how do we know how strong it is? Are you ready? Are you willing? Are you able to hear Jesus when he says, take up your cross and follow me? Is your faith ready to sacrifice everything, anything, for the sake of Christ? Is it ready to suffer? Will it withstand testing, challenge, true hardship, persecution? Am I ready to be hungry, to be dismissed and scorned because of my faith? to have all my comforts that I love and enjoy taken away from me just so much as I get to keep Jesus. Maybe we want to be tested for a time before we wander out into the wilderness. Another way to look at this is besides the words come, sit, and stay Perhaps no command is more important to teach your dog than leave it. Because a dog will naturally eat whatever is put in front of them, whether it's even food or not. So unless you tell them that they need your permission to eat something, they might just eat something they should not. Or to put it another way, one of the challenges of parenting is teaching children self-control and so instead of acting on impulse, a child will think before she does. Because acting without thinking is a good way to get ourselves hurt. Jesus says, out of the heart come sinful thoughts. And today people use this justification for anything they want to do. The heart wants what the heart wants. Our minds can know what is right or wrong. By faith we can know what, how God would have us act, what he would want us to do. But our hearts, they don't want to listen. So I wonder, how often do we tell ourselves no? Do we practice self-control in all parts of our lives? Do we tell our hearts, leave it? Do we think before we act? And not just about what we will find more pleasurable in this exact moment, but what will please the Lord. Do we know how to withhold our hand? Or do we merely act out whatever our impulses may be? Now, fasting, as Jesus describes it, is not keeping yourself from sinful things. Because if you are sinning, if you are continuing to live in a specific sin, Jesus has a very different message for you. Repent. Stop it. Ask God for mercy. Receive his forgiveness by faith. You don't need to wait for Lent to stop stealing. We don't give up cussing for just 40 days or, you know, give up gossiping for just a little while. A Christian can never embrace sin, no matter whatever season we find ourselves in. However, a fast that Jesus describes is giving up something that is not sinful in itself. It might be something good, something you like and enjoy, but not to earn special favor in God, but to teach yourself to say no. To train your hand not to reach out to train your eyes to look away, to train your belly that it doesn't need all those things. So that the, when the devil comes with his real temptations, when your heart and your flesh cry out for all the things which would ensnare your soul to destruction, you have already practiced and trained yourself to say no. Not here to tell you that you should fast. 
Jesus doesn't even say you have to fast. There is no order to fast for Christians. But we also can't ignore that the Christian church, for most of its history, practiced fasting in the season of Lent. Although sometimes they were much more like the hypocrites than they were like those listening to Jesus' own words. I'm not here just to talk to you about the practical effects of fasting. But reading, because if you read these words as nothing more than a practical guide so that you can have a better life of faith, you'd be missing Jesus' most important point. Jesus continues, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so today Jesus asks you, where is your treasure? What is your treasure? What makes your heart skip a beat and begin to pound? What gets you the most excited what lingers on your mind? What makes you feel the most content, secure, strong, or safe? For what are you working? For what are you saving? For what are you living? What is it that you can't imagine living without? What is it? that you cannot live without? What is it that gets the majority of your time, your energy, your attention, or your worry? What is it that brings you the most joy? Where your treasure is, there your heart also will be. Now, the moment you stop caring for your home, it gets pretty disgusting in there quite quickly. And then the pests begin to find their way in, and if you let it go long enough, it begins to crumble. Vehicles that don't get driven begin to wear down, and so they're worse than when you put them away, unless you're very careful about how you store it. Your dollar is worth less today than it was last year. And any money in a simple savings account loses its value every single day. In this city, if you leave your possessions in your car, they might as well be public possessions, just waiting for anyone to come and help themselves. I try to work out every day. And my dogs demand to be walked each and every morning. And I know if I skip a few days and I let it go, my body quickly begins to deteriorate. Besides that, it only takes one microscopic little bug to knock you off your feet. So if I make any of those things my God, what a sad God that is. If I make them my focus, my source of happiness and security, if I put my trust and treasure up anything on earth, how foolish that is. A God that needs my support, my protection, and my, and my focus like that and will never last. What a terrible God that is. Why would I want my heart to dwell with those kinds of treasures? And so while we need all those things, and God certainly gives us all those things, and he gives them so that we can care for our lives, so that we can care for our families, for our brothers and sisters in Christ, for our friends, for our community, for our society, God, we must make sure we cannot allow those two to get mixed up. God gives us those things for us to use to for our own lives and for the purpose of building up others 
They are to serve us. He has not given us to serve them. They are not your treasure. And so the season of Lent is an opportunity to give your heart this much needed checkup. Where is it? For whom or for what does it beat? What is your greatest treasure? Because in Lent, God has given you his greatest treasure. He gives his own son. And he will take you on a journey with him from the upper room to the cross of Calvary. He feeds you with his own holy supper. He showers you with his mercy, with his love. He makes the payment for your sin. He removes that great burden of all of your debts. God in Christ gives you his greatest treasure. He gives you your greatest treasure. Life, hope, joys that never tarnish, never rust, need no maintenance and cannot be stolen. They cannot be stolen by all the evils of this world, not even by Satan and all his demons and the might of hell. And so Jesus says, store up these treasures. Live in them. Pursue them. For where your heart is, there your for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. A heart that belongs to God and serves him only will certainly never lose its reward. When the doctor runs their test, they can make the comparison. They can compare your results to what a healthy range would possibly be. Or they might be able to compare it to what it was the last time you had those tests run. But comparisons are not what this checkup is all about. We aren't hoping to find our faith is within normal parameters, whatever that would possibly mean for us. Trimming a few extra things in your life may distract, that may distract you from Christ. And storing up heavenly treasures, it's not going to be like cutting a few calories and watching as you trim a few inches off your waistline. No, spiritual growth is not in a straight line. It doesn't go straight up, and it rarely goes straight down. Rather, it is a constant struggle, a daily struggle, requiring daily repentance, needing constant forgiveness, and a rich helping of God's great mercy. And whether or not some sort of fast, giving up anything this Lent is a tool that you are going to use in that struggle or not, Remember this, your reward is always found in Christ. It is his work and his righteousness. It is his love and his mercy. It is his strength and his victory. This Lent, we watch Jesus fulfill all of God's word to bring you salvation. And so as we watch him, may God feed us with what our hearts need the most, with his love. May our hearts long for him because his heart always pounds for you. In him, God's mercies never fail. Amen. Please rise. And now the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let us join now in confessing our common faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, his only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. 
For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated as we worship the Lord with our offering. We join saying the responsive prayer of the church as you can find in your service folder. Holy and righteous God, as we begin again the solemn spiritual journey of Lent, we come before you in deep humility. We confess that we are sinners, both by the nature we inherit and by the sinful thoughts and desires, words and actions that that nature produces. Because of our sins, we deserve only your wrath and punishment. Yet you reveal yourself not only as a God of holiness and justice, but a God of mercy and love, despairing of our own merits and worthiness. And in response to your gracious invitation, we come pleading for your forgiveness. You have revealed your love and mercy for us sinners in Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. We sent him, you sent him into our world to be the atoning sacrifice for the sins of all people. Help us to grasp by faith the great truth that the pain and suffering, the mockery and ridicule, and the death and punishment he endured should have been ours. Help us understand that in incomprehensible love he suffered and died for us. In silent meditation, let us reflect on our sins, praise our Savior for the forgiveness he has won for us, and ask for God's continual grace to remove any doubt that we are forgiven. God of grace and mercy, may your spirit continue to be with us as we follow the way of the cross. And as we contemplate the story of our Savior's passion, build us up in our faith. Renew in us the zeal to serve you by reflecting your love in our lives. Give us the desire and the ability to boldly proclaim the grace in which we stand, so that all for whom you lived and died may join us in fellowship now and in your presence forever. We offer our humble thanks and praise for our prayers and petitions and ourselves in body and spirit to you, Lord God. Hear us according to your God, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Please rise. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. 
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who brought the gift of salvation to all people by his death on the tree of the cross, so that the devil, who overcame us by a tree, would in turn by a tree be overcome. Therefore, with all your saints on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. We give thanks to you, O God, through your dear Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be our Savior, our Redeemer, and the messenger of your grace. Through him you made all things. In him you are well pleased. He is the incarnate Word, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. To fulfill your promises, he stretched out his hands on the cross and released from eternal death all who believe in you. As we remember Jesus' death and resurrection, we thank you that you have gathered us together to receive your Son's body and blood. Send us your Spirit, unite us as one, and strengthen our faith that we may praise you in your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we glorify and honor you, O God our Father, with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please rise. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn, hymn 393, Savior when in dust to you.
evening. It is a very blessed opportunity to worship with all of you tonight. We especially welcome our guests and those who are joining us online. The only announcement I have to highlight is that we will continue to have Lenten evening services at 6.30 on Wednesdays and that there will be a simple soup supper before each of those services, probably starting around 5.45. So the Lord be with you until we meet again. <laughs>